My guest today is Evan Osnos, who is a staff writer for The New Yorker and a contributor to CNN. Evan lived overseas for many years, mostly in China. And when he returned to the US in 2013, he found himself feeling like something of a, a stranger in his own land. And the events of the next few years just only added to that sense of foreignness. So uh, he set out to find out what had changed to, to make it feel so foreign to him. And he did that by returning to the places that he knew best and, and reporting from them. So that's Greenwich, Connecticut, where Evan grew up, Clarksburg in West Virginia, where he started his reporting career, and Chicago, where he moved on from West Virginia to work for the Tribune and cover the politics uh, of the city. And the result of that work is his new book, Wildland, The Making of America's Fury, which is already a New York Times bestseller and, and being heaped with critical acclaim. A story that Evan tells us of a country that's ever more divided by class and by geography and by politics, but, but actually more connected than ever by the ties of the modern economy. We talk about the financialization of the economy and the transformation as a result of his, of his hometown of Greenwich becoming the, the hedge fund capital of the nation and how decisions there affected people in Chicago and, and Clarksburg. We also talk about the, the battles over the coal industry, the rise of Trump, of course, and the potential for Joe Biden to bring the nation back together. We also discuss cleavages of race and wealth uh, in cities uh, like Chicago and, and how the conditions were created, the, the wild land, as he described in his title, that it only took uh, a match to be struck like Donald Trump to create some of the problems that we're, we're seeing now. Although he is worried, as I am, about the seclusion of mind, to use his phrase, uh, of some of the groups in America, he actually ends on an optimistic note. Uh, he thinks that the pandemic has demonstrated that whether we like it or not, that we're all in this together and that that will create some momentum for, for change. As you can probably tell um, when you listen, I absolutely love this conversation. I'm a huge fan of Evans and, and of his work, and I really hope you enjoy it too. Evan Osnos, welcome to Dialogues. Thanks, Richard. Great to be with you. Yeah, well, I'm thrilled you came on. Uh, loved your book. Let's just get this. Let's get all the praise out of the way at the beginning, so that we can spend the remaining fifty-nine no, we can, minutes. We can use it for praise if you want. That's <laughs> no. I, I think it's early just to get it out of the way. That was <laughs> fast. That didn't take very long. I noticed. <laughs> no, it's just getting going. I mean, it's just uh, it's very richly reported, uh, uh, beautifully written. Uh, just you know, almost on every page, there was just uh, another moment where I learned something or I was was moved by a story and so on. And you, and you, Thank you. The, way you've, the way you've constructed the book is by going to some places that you know and you've worked in, Clarksburg, West Virginia, Chicago, and where you grew up, Greenwich. And we'll, we'll talk about each of those. And, but you tell stories of people in those places over time and what that tells us about the state of our society and, and each other. And that's very much your, that's your MO, is to use stories, right? You're, yeah. you're a, a, absolutely a storyteller and you let that speak to the condition. What, you know, you started as a cub reporter, you can't, what, there are many directions you could have gone in with your writing, yeah. right? What, what do you think was the thing that made you this sort of a anthropologist, frankly, uh, in, in your writing? Yeah, I think uh, part of it is, I did actually at various points, um, consider the alternatives in the sense that there was about a five minute period, for instance, when I was a newspaper reporter, when I got kind of seduced by this new realm of, of data analysis, which was growing in journalism and has been very important uh, over the years of people sort of figuring out, oh, okay, this is the amount of money that's being applied for certain kinds of municipal policies versus other things. And that that's the way that you make a case, you make an argument and ultimately, um, and, and what I concluded, honestly, though, was that I think I, I wanted to be out in the world. I, I, I was not particularly happy um, at my desk, uh, present company excluded at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I, and, and so I was a foreign correspondent, essentially, and continue more or less to be. I mean, to be perfectly candid, I guess I would say I've never been somebody who is really inclined to want to um, become the become dominant in the Washington journalism game. I don't really see that particular world of 
I think there should be kind of term limits, actually, on doing this kind of journalism in Washington. I'm, and, and that's a fault. I will announce that actually as a fault, that I think there is a little bit of a bit of a skittering attention span. I mean, my attention span tends to be eight year blocks. But, you know, there are people who are capable of sustaining one focus on Washington or on another place for 30 years, 40 years. And I think that can be valuable. I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's really where I where I mm. where I find myself. So well, that's I, an indirect answer to your question. I mean, I think the, the honest answer is I like the ethnography of writing about uh, my own country. And I think that I am in my own tradi- like the tradition of writing that I come out of at The New Yorker and that I sort of have always been attracted to is the assemblage of small detail and the revealing the revealing almost the smaller the better i mean if somebody's wristwatch tells you how they think mm-hmm. about the world then then that's satisfying as a reader to me and i find that more satisfying than me braying in the first sentence of the story about what i think even if i might bray in my own way later yeah it makes me think about that book the elizabeth Holcat. Uh, what's her name Curried Holcat, I think, is the sum of small things. Right. Uh, and Which I think that I that's quite a right good summary. Now, you, recomm- you recommended to me at one point along the way, Richard, not to betray our uh, uh, I, cheek by jowl. Well, really? this is because evidently you recommend it to everybody. But no, I, um, you did recommend it. And, and did you read it? it? Did you read it? Did let's you read just it? say I was, I was briefed on the contents. No, I you bought it and I read it because... I'd said to you, I'm interested in this kind of anthropology of American wealth. And um, and as you often do, you, you really knew what the relevant literature was. And so I, I think, yeah, I do. I find that I am seduced, I think, a little bit um, by by the idea of anthropology, even with the caveats that come with it, which is. A- but you're, you're sort of mag- magnifying in. I mean, Elizabeth's book. Um, uh, and I'm saying Elizabeth because I can't remember her second name, not because I know her, but um, <laughs> you've got it on your shelf. So I've got it on my shelf somewhere. But she has that great st- story about kind of rich people cutting the labels out of their expensive dresses so right. the housekeepers don't see it. And it's the same with you com- comparing the, the watches that the guys at Goldman Sachs wear or whatever. And what I think you do is you sort of drill into a detail and then you pan out, right? So there's this sort of, you have this great. Uh, moment where you talk about how someone had to sell a house in Chicago and the, uh, because they just got underwater after the financial crisis. And, and then you just like in one bare sentence say, you know, he sold the house for 65000 Someone came along, bought it cheaply, made some renovations and sold it a few weeks for 265000 And yeah, that's, that's all your sentence says, actually. But it's yeah. Yeah, but it's that sort of moment, and then you pan out, and then you have your seasoning of social science, mm-hmm. and, uh, with it, and then you talk about inequality and so on. But there's just enough sort of social science in there to contextualize the detail. You know, I'm 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 unnerved by the fact that you've zeroed in on what is sort of the secret hidden technology of New Yorker writing, and so I will now, because you've gotten close enough, I feel the need to announce it, which is that if you can, that the the, the the coin of the realm in that kind of nonfiction, at least as far as I'm concerned, is to get so close to the point of saying what it is that you're trying to say that you never have to put it quite so explicitly. And so take that as an example. And I love that you zeroed in on that. You know, that's a case in which I describe how this family lost their house, you know, and so on, and that eventually somebody bought it put in a little bit of renovation, flipped it on the market, sold it for a quarter of a million dollars. And what I was really saying is, and there, dear reader, is how the conveyor belt of wealth is interrupted for a family like that. Why it is that that family never, not just now, but also reaching back generations, has ever been able to accumulate um, anything approximating uh, inheritable wealth. And why that means that they are then at such a compounded disadvantage from from everybody else. And if I wrote that, then an editor of a certain kind would have snipped that out and said, you know, you don't if you my dear dad, for instance, who who is was an editor for a long time and a publisher sometimes says. And he may have said this to me when I was young, and maybe that's how I internalized it, but that if you draw the horse well enough, you don't have to write horse beneath it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well that's a that's actually now that i think about the way you write that's a perfect description of it but then you will have you then you know qu- quote patrick sharkey's work on, on right. deep segregation and raj chetty's work on inequality and so on but i want to come back to chicago but let's go back a little bit to greenwich where 
Yeah. Well, you you grew up, uh, and is in some ways you just is the epicenter of the American inequality story. I think you actually make the point that the inequality story is more about what's happening at the top than in the middle and the bottom, uh, which I think mm -hmm. is correct uh, analytically. And particularly what kind of what happened when you grew up, even something your own street uh, mm. changed. I think it en ended up with, was, that, was it your street that became Rogue's, uh, Rogue's Street? Yeah. And so how, it's, it's a big part of your book. I think you describe very honestly the way that that's changed, but can you just mm. sort of do the sketch version of how, mm -hmm. particularly when you came back? So it's worth saying you kind of came back and did a kind of- sure you know, what the fuck um, yeah. has happened. But, and part of that was going back to your hometown. So what, how, is, how is the Greenwich that you found different to the Greenwich that you knew? Well, it's, it's a place that has been more or less since the Industrial Revolution and the sort of end of the 19th century has been rich. And it's been part of what I would sort of think of as kind of the engine room of American capitalism. And so at various points along the way, you've been able to draw some lessons of, of what that tells you about American wealth. So for instance, you know, at a certain point, the fortunes that were being made in Greenwich around the turn of the early 20th century were industrial fortunes. You know, the guy who was the first person to commercialize the mattress and, you know, made mattresses available for, for middle class people instead of just rich people. Fast forward to the beginning of the 21st century and something else had happened, which was fascinating, which was that the financial revolution, which had sort of grown out from Wall Street and had continued to build, um, had landed in Greenwich because of a couple of specific reasons. One, the internet allowed financiers to move outside of New York City. Two, tax rates in Connecticut were very advantageous, so people were living there if they could. Um, and then, uh, and 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 it was also a boom time in alternative investments like hedge funds and private equity. Partly because the dot com bubble had burst, interest rates were low after nine eleven. All it was sort of the perfect combination of qualities to create this moment in which you had this tremendous profusion of financial wealth. And I use that word specifically in Greenwich. Um, and the reason I think it's interesting and sort of subtle to point out is, look, when I was a kid there, it's a, a preposterously great place to be a kid. I mean, I'm growing, I'm going to these incredible public schools as a kid, you know, the kind of public school that has a water polo team and an electron microscope. I mean, just an extraordinary set of advantages. And, and yet at the same time, when I was a kid, it was also a place that had, a, it was, you, you know, teachers could live in town. There were people who were, it, there was, even if you, I mean, if we're looking at the statistics, you would see that there was just, and I know I have to bracket this within the, yes, we're still talking about the 1% of Americans, but even within that 1%, there was some range. And one of the things that happened over the course of the first 20 years of this century was that it became increasingly um, homogenized and sort of sterilized as a financial capital. It became known as the hedge fund capital of the world. I mean, in empirical terms, Richard, you know, there was a, a rating done in 2004 of the 25 largest hedge fund managers in America who had made on average $207 million in the previous year. And not, not cumulative, just one year. Mm. And 10 of the 25 were either living or working in this one town. That fascinated me. And I wanted mm -hmm. to understand what was the impact on things like values, on norms, on how people perceived wealth and responsibility and citizenship and politics. And those were the, those were the things that I was kind of wandering off into. You tell you tell a, a great story of that transformation within Greenwich that you that you know very and the, and and as a an emblem of the financialization of the of the American economy. But what I think one of the questions I had for you is, what's wrong with wealth? Right. Uh, I mean, one level is because you're not just talking about there's more money, but it's almost like it's a different kind of money, right? And it seems to me that you can have different problems with wealth and people do have different problems with wealth, right? They can have a moral objection, which is just, it's just morally wrong for some people to have that much money when other people don't have very much. There's a political objection, which is it's wrong to have that much money if you can then use that money to alter politics in your favor, which is more of a campaign finance type argument. Yep. There's also a, an aesthetic problem 
with yeah. certain kinds of money. Uh, you know, it's, it's how they spend it. Mm. Um, and you talk about someone who builds a house as big as the Taj Mahal and so on. And there was parts of me that's running like so, there's can be an undercurrent almost of snobbery to mm. this discussion sure. too. It's like it was yeah. fine to be incredibly rich as long as you hit it well. Right. right. The classic, the British royal family drive around and beat up old Volvos. Right. right. And, right. and British, British, British aristocrats know that the really rich ones, are the ones that look poor. And sometimes right. when you talk about what it was like under the bushes and what it's like now, right. it's, it's, it's like the nouveau riche came in and right. they just built, built ghastly big houses. So, so where do you, where do you position your, your, what makes you uncomfortable about the wealth? Is it the morality? Is it the politics? Is it the size of their houses? What is it? What, what's wrong with wealth? It's it's actually the aesthetics doesn't bother me in the slightest. I mean, it, I actually think of that as sort of a return to the mean because you know at the turn of the, at the beginning of the twentieth century, actually there were the I mean people were building things that were even more gonzo than they are now. I mean mm. they were building po- these you know what were essentially mansions modeled on the old European estates, and it was an a, a more explicit attempt actually to try to generate American aristocracy. Aristocracy. Um, what I think I find interesting, and and from my perspective, it's not that I think it's not it's you know if you were uh, assembling your menu of options, it wasn't really number one that that caught my attention. It was partly number two about the effect on politics, but actually the biggest one is one that perhaps that you didn't identify specifically, which is that I think there it produces a, a form of seclusion, a seclusion of the mind, a segregation of the mind. That, that this is, and I will lean a bit on Michael Sandel's work about what he's called the skyboxification of American life, in which there is this way in which you can tailor your experience so that you become utterly protected from the injury of awareness of anybody who is too far beyond your conception of of uh, of, of of that of the system as. As, as you've experienced it, meaning if you think the system is meritocratic and is more or less delivering capital where it should go, you can actually build your life now almost physically and certainly in, in experiential terms um, to, to avoid anything that contradicts that. And I was struck by that because I don't have any illusions that the, in the olden days that the Bush family uh, were say, weren't saying terrible things about the proles. That's just I mean, <laughs> that's just the, how it works. But what I what I think is interesting is when you actually look at the political attitudes that Prescott Bush, who was the father of a president and the grandfather of a president, he was the senator from the state of Connecticut, and he was also essentially the leading politician from Greenwich, Connecticut. In the 1950s, he stood for certain ideas, like the idea that taxation is a necessary feature of a functioning political commons, that if you have more wealth, you should expect to pay more. Those kinds of things... Uh, were not they were not you know he was not a Bolshevik but he was also in in any, in many ways he was not uh, he was he was fairly he was fairly typical um, and what I what I was struck by is that today I'm going to give you just a, a real example yeah. um, is that there was a candidate for governor from Greenwich in 2013 named Thomas Foley who. Uh, has done well as a private equity executive. He has a collection of classic cars. He has two British fighter jets. He lives in a house that the local paper described as resembling the Hogwarts castle. And when the reporters asked him to produce his tax return, he showed that he had paid $673 in federal tax the last year, the previous year, because of, as he described it, investment losses and alimony payments. That is a difference from Prescott Bush. And in a sense, you know, I, you have to kind of recognize that or or there's no way to describe any change. Over mm. time. Yeah. And it's interesting how the the relationship between the shift in norms and policy and politics, uh, how you tease out the causality there is something I kind of think about a, a lot. Um, because on the one hand, you've got this, I agree with this sort of segregation fact, right, which is just there's a... Um, a separation from other people, which can uh, be for all kinds of reasons. I think one of the reasons is because these people are sort of unashamedly meritocratic in the kind of Michael Sandel yeah. sense. Right. In fact, I had David Brooks on a podcast talking about wondering actually whether the new new elite were better than the old elite, which he used to think they were, because they're sort of so brazenly meritocratic that they don't have any sense of owing something back. But 
there's a weird paradox that seems to be that runs through your book and i'm going to state it and see if you agree with it which mm -hmm. is on the one hand i see that the thread of your book is really the threads the threads between people it's the fact that even as we're divided and separate the connections between us are very strong and we can draw a couple of those out maybe between decisions made by people who live in greenwich and what that means for people who live on the south side of chicago like mm -hmm. the homeowner and or i might i might just add one thing to say they're diabolically strong they're not strong in any sort of sentimental sense but anyway go on you know that they are sh sh yeah but that but that's isn't that sort of the that's the paradox is that right. the economic economically we're more connected than ever before um and and yet less proximate you, you use the yes. word proximate i think you're channeling brian stevens but That's so right. there's a weird thing like more connected and less proximate knowing each other less and you quote someone talking about white collar law white there's not there isn't more white collar crime but it's more is this guy salt is i think yes um, more psychological distance so is that yes is that a fair summary of, right. of the paradox here now that's an elegant description of what i find to be the most exciting sort of feature of this is that we are we are distanced, we are uh, apart in a whole range of ways, almost down to the level of biology. I mean, one of the things I describe in the book is how radical the differences are between living in one place and living in another, to the point that the life expectancy differences are almost two decades. I mean, and, and yet and yet we share an, an economic system in which somebody living in Greenwich can make a series of investment decisions, quite minor decisions, actually. They're not even the kinds of things that would constitute a huge, a huge play. And that can have profound cascading effects on a set of companies in West Virginia, which then has effects on how those workers regard the fairness, justice, and legitimacy of the American political system. And I tell this story in sort of in, through individual lives in specific terms, because I think that's the the way to make it vibrant. But yeah, in my mind, there, there's sort of one moment in there that drives this home, which is that there's a coal miner who I quote in West Virginia, who says to me uh, at one point, talking about the rise in CEO salaries, compensation. He says, have you ever met anybody who is worth 400 or 500 other men? Because I haven't. And I thought that was like his own, it was quite a, it was quite a, it was quite a poignant way of capturing his bewilderment and rage at the scale of the difference. And I think this gets to one of the things that underlies your reading of the book that is very important which is, you know, to what degree are things worse or better or, or than they are in the past. And one of the things that I really believe is that when differences become so vast, they become not just differences of degree, but differences of kind. And that it changes in a deep way how the system functions or doesn't function. And um, so when, C, you know, when the average CEO of a public company goes from making, you know, 28 times a frontline worker to making 280 times, that is more than just a, gosh, we've lost a, a bit of our balance here. That's actually, we've entered into a different phase of how these, of how the physics of the economy are working. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's right. I also think that it's good to go back to this culture, politics, policy combination a bit you talk about policy choices but but my my basic presumption is that culture precedes politics mm. and politics precedes policy and so whilst it's true that you saw deregulation of wall street uh which allowed for some of the financial stuff that you talk about very well but but i'm struck by that's that actually really jumped out at me as well that idea of worth because it's really getting at this idea of merit and the truth is that the sort of modern meritocrats would say, well, I must be worth that because that's what the market's giving me. And so right. if you assume that the market's operating efficiently and meritocratically, then they're right. Amartya Sen has this great line where he says, the trouble with meritocracy is the winners always get to determine what counts as merit. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it comes to this culture point, like there's nothing to stop German CEOs paying themselves 435 times more than German workers. They just don't. Yeah. There's no law in Germany. So they just don't, and they wouldn't occur to it. So, so it is almost like a normative problem before yes. it's a I policy so. problem. And that's why I actually, do, I, you know, I do, I, I sort of look at the policy questions and I say, partly because that's not new ground for me. It's not, I mean, meaning it's not new ground that I can contribute. What I actually find most interesting is exactly that. It's the normative questions. It's the cultural questions. What is it in Greenwich? that 
changed in the way that people talk to one another about wealth, in the way that one imagines their their relationship to the state. And this is not to say that I think that, you know, everything was peachy in the old days. And I should say here, you know, one of the things I never actually say in the book explicitly, but kind of runs through my mind is my family is this bit of a mix. On my mother's side, it's wasps who moved to Greenwich. On my father's side, we're Jewish. And Greenwich had a long tradition of anti-Semitism, some of which I mention in the book. And I'm kind of always, that always is on my mind that kind of is a is a, an outer bound against romanticizing the old days because it was exclusive in those, in those very specific ways. But I, I guess that's the thing that interests me is what changed in the culture? Because it was not just, you know, I tend to spend most of my time talking about Republicans, but a lot of folks in Greenwich who uh, are involved in the hedge fund economy are also Democrats. I'm sure they also have lots of the right views on certain things, and we'll maybe get into classism a little bit if, if there's time. But just actually, I, I want to go to West Virginia in a minute, but let's just stay on Greenwich for one more beat, because actually this shift of mindset of entitlement, right? I mean, I've my sense actually is that there is an entitlement culture in the US, but it's at the top. Mm. And it is this sense of like, uh, of, uh, I mean, actually this great book, I think it's Aaron James wrote like how, how to be the assholes and how to avoid it. This? And he describes an asshole as someone who not only cuts in line, but thinks that they deserve to. Right. So a, a jerk is someone that cuts in line, but really knows they shouldn't. An asshole is someone who cuts in line saying, because I'm more important than you. And mm. the, the best example of assholery, mm. if to yes. use a technical to use the term. Tech, yeah, I'm, we're getting into the weeds, <laughs> right. but I'm glad I we mean, are. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, we're getting deep into political philosophy here. It's actually a very serious book. Will, is Operation Varsity Blues? Yes. Uh, and this FBI sting, and it turns out one of your neighbours yes. was one of the people who paid to have his daughter's SAT score changed. And you talked to him. I think even since the book came out, I That's think you've right. talked to him as well. So who is he, and what did he do, and what did he? How did he justify it to you? Because that's a that is a case study in entitlement. It, I mean, in its own way, I I was a bit obsessed with what Varsity Blues tells us about the health of American elite culture and, 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 the, and the ill health. And it happened to be that one of my neighbors in Greenwich, a few doors away, uh, was a man named Gordon Kaplan, who was the chairman of Wilkie Farr, a major American lawyer. I mean, one of the most um, powerful American legal figures who then paid $75,000 to have his daughter's ACT exams changed. And he's, he was on tape having said one of the more memorable expressions from the scandal, which was the moral element doesn't bother me. And I ended up talking to him about, I honestly, Richard, that was one of those cases in which the, it essentially consisted of me just asking, what possessed you? What possessed you? I mean, in, in how did you come to believe that this was a good idea and a, a defensible idea and in any way, um, a thing to do. And he said, well, and we, we talked for a while about it. And in the end, the nub of it is that he said, well, I basically came to believe that the entire college admissions process is corrupt and that everybody is engaged in some form of corruption, whatever is available to them. And therefore, if I didn't do it, I was disadvantaging myself and my daughter and I couldn't afford to do that. And one could extrapolate that, that view beyond just college admissions. And you, it's essentially the worldview of Donald Trump's vision of the American uh, political society and the view of a certain kind of economic decision maker who says, well, it's dog eat dog. If I don't do it, somebody else will. I'm just doing what the law allows. Maybe I'm venturing into the gray zone here of what the law doesn't allow. But that is a, it's a whole worldview contained in that comment. And I thought of it as one of the uh, it was helpful for me in understanding. Mm. Yeah, same. I mean, it, obviously, it was kind of manna from heaven in a way for those of us that work on on these issues, including. In, you know, and I think that's right. Also, it's a nice. It, it's the analogy to financial services too. I think is quite strong because I'm just thinking about it now. When you use the word corruption, right? You, like, there's a technical definition of corruption. Right? Is this is this corrupt? Was that insider trading or not? Right. And there's a line. The line is defined by the law. And what the Operation Varsity Blues people did was to cross that line. They're quite right. The whole admissions process is corrupt. It's deeply corrupt. And so you have a, 
but it's a corrupt culture. Mm -hmm. And then there's some, and then somewhere in the middle of that corrupt culture, there's a line which says, this is a line you can't go past everything up to that line. Right is okay but that's a deeper kind of corruption well and this is I, it was this gets also to the earlier point about trying to track change over time and i was struck that there's a, a somebody who i mentioned in the book named john bogle who was a great uh financier he created vanguard group it was sort of he's sort of mm. considered one of the fathers of mutual funds and he was in the finance business for 50 years and he said at one point shortly before he died he said you know there were things when i came into this business that you just simply wouldn't do because not because they weren't they weren't legal you just wouldn't do them and and now everybody does them and the reason i mention that is you know you could interpret that and say well that's just you know either he's being naive or he's somehow trying to romanticize the past but he has no incentive to do either actually and he's not a, he was not a naive person but I think he's actually identifying, and I heard this from many others, that there really has been a degree to which um, the system it was not that it was system wasn't working. It was that the system, and this has now become a cliche as a concept in other realms, but that the system was working exactly as intended. And that what had happened was people became so good at the system in whatever way you want to define that, whether it's college admissions or um, investing or um, using your influence to affect policy outcomes, that the effects became so pronounced that they produced all of these mutant impacts on American life. And that's what I find kind of fascinating. Um, and I, you know, I've actually from a right, this is, you know, for the writers out there, I had a, a fascinating kind of round and round with my editor. I was trying to conceptualize this. And what I ended up describing was something in the book I call honing the edges, where people were able to hone the edges of their various systems in a way that allowed the winners to keep winning. And that becomes sort of one of the fight. That's, that's one of the things you see in Varsity Blues, but you see elsewhere. For a long time, I'd been trying to describe that as sort of the optimization, that people had optimized all these different systems. And he kept coming back to me and saying, that's not going to work. People, that, people don't understand what you're trying to say. So I, I am now, um, you know, I, now that I've been let out of the pen, I'm going to try it out here. And it's not really very effective either. But that concept, Richard, is sort of the thing that I, that I saw over and over again, which was that it was not that the systems were broken. It was that the systems were being used um, to a sort of terrible beauty. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think comes through very strongly. And if a different kind of book might have talked about virtue and civic virtue and so on too. And I, I do think one of the potential dangers with regulation is that it can in some ways come to substitute for a normative culture. And so it can come to be, so is this allowed? Mm. Is this within the rules rather than is this right? Um, now, I also think that that's, that's not, in the end, a very good argument against regulation. And to some extent, once you get to a certain point, you need more and more regulation. But I do worry a little bit about that. It's like, do, you, yeah. do, you do we end up leaning too hard on financial regulation, say, rather than on some sense of an ethos of what's, you know, just isn't done? Well, I guess, I mean, there is always a, there's a, a feedback loop, too, which is that reflect that regulations are, in some sense, a stimulus to our behavior and also a reflection of our behavior. And we read them as such, meaning, like, if the rules say that I cannot call up a researcher who is working on a drug trial and pay that man money to tell me what the results are before that's publicly available. If the law says that insider that that's insider trading, I actually won't do it as often. Some people will, and I tell stories in the book of people yeah, you who do. do precisely mm. that. But you know, one of the inter I sort of find one of the interesting conclusions that somebody reaches is that the way that those lines are drawn are you know, they have the illusion of permanence, but are in fact you know, they are uh, they are features of a time and a sensibility. I mean, there was no law against bribing foreign officials until the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the mid 1970s, which is now one of the most frequently prosecuted white collar crimes in America. So but I don't see that as an argument against re regulation so much as I say that um, I, I actually think that in some cases, particularly when people are resorting to the law as a defense for for immoral conduct that you have to then make the law a leading indicator rather than a, a lagging indicator. Uh, and the law is also a teacher in that sense too. So let's go to West Virginia okay. um, and, and the coal industry. And let's actually go back in time for you as well, because 
you started your career there as a writer, having applied to a, a number a, of as a photographer, actually a terrible as, photographer, as a, photographer. <laughs> a, a photographer, and was it when you an intern? Yeah. Uh, intern, and so how did you get the job? Uh, and then how did it feel to go there? Is that because you'd been in Greenwich and then college and then to there? Uh, how did it? I mean, did you like being there? Do you still think of it as a, a place of affection? I loved it actually, and I came to it in a quirky way, which is that I was an undergraduate. Um, I'd done a lot of work in photography and filmmaking. I'd sort of gotten very interested in documentary work, particularly there's a tradition of great documentary photography in the South that goes back to people like Walker Evans, who did uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men with James Agee. And I was kind of deep in the romance of this, of this kind of work. And so when I was getting to the end of college, um, I applied for a bunch of I applied for jobs, internships as a photographer at little newspapers were all over the South, but actually also all the way up to Homer, Alaska. And um, I only got one offer. I, I really shouldn't, I, I really can't <laughs> emphasize enough just how inferior my work was, but I did get one <laughs> offer. And, and to their credit, they said, you can come. And it's the Clarksburg Exponent Telegram, which was, it was, just this fantastically ambitious little newspaper in a town of 16,000 people in Northern West Virginia. And I mean, Richard, it's kind of glorious to remember they had two newspapers that were published every day in this little town on the, on the press right there in the building, cranking out this thing. And you know, part of the reason why newspapers have this great tradition in West Virginia is because the roads are so bad that you could never deliver a newspaper very far. As a result, just about every 20 miles, there was a new newspaper. And so there was this, and I, you know, I, I, I glory in some of that history of this stuff. But it, I went to West Virginia then, uh, so as a, you know, I was, a, I was 22 years old and it got under my skin. It really is a place that is fascinating. It's the only state in the union that was created by seceding from the Confederacy and joining the, joining the union. I mean, they were, it, it is, um, maddeningly independent and 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 hard to predict sometimes. And so, if you go back over looking at its political history, its economic history, it's full of strange turns that makes it persistently. And I find myself going back to it over and over again over the years. I mean, on September 11th, 2001, I was at that point a newspaper reporter at the Chicago Tribune, but I was on my way to Clarksburg, West Virginia, to do a story when uh, when the when the planes hit the towers, and I you know, ended up rerouting and going back. And essentially it rerouted the next decade of my life. And I would, you know, ended up overseas. But so I, mm. when I came back to the US, I was pretty determined to get down to West Virginia and understand what was happening politically. You you have this, I think you point this out in the book that one of the COVID uh, slogans out of West Virginia was social distancing since 1863, which I think was just like a perfect encapsulation of 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 that of that spirit and i i agree with a lot of what you've said about it but in terms of like the obviously the coal industry is huge and the, the politics of that remain remain huge and that i don't want to get it I, i'm not really wanting to get into any of the day-to-day -day politics here i'm much more interested in how you think the financialization of the u.s economy changed the lives of coal miners many of whom you so you you have spent a lot of time with coal miners themselves also with environmental activists with young political activists i mean you tell this kind of very rich story and actually now that now now that i know more about your background it makes sense to me that your storytelling is so visual mm. you've just you've just switched it to painting your pictures or taking your pictures with words rather than mm -hmm. with imagery but um you actually have a nice adage from here which is uh i think the old from the college was the company gets the profits the miners get the shaft yeah right good uh, so that's and that's an old adage. Yeah, that's not new. So what's what, what, what's different? So, coal miners have always been, you know, screwed shafted, up, shafted. Yeah, and right. that one of the things that I found really important that was sort of one of those moments of discovery in this process was uh, realizing that there are moments of change in the story of the decline and fall of the coal industry, and that it matters how it failed. That's actually the hmm. you know to meaning it has political implications, whether it fails, whether it, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it briefly, which mm. is, yeah, 
for a long time, basically, the coal industry didn't have much relationship, actually, to Wall Street. It was not an attractive industry. It was very dirty, had a lot of problems. It had union contracts that made it very hard to buy and sell companies. And then right around the beginning of this century, um, partly because of the growth of alternative investments, things like private equity and hedge funds, they began to look at coal as an option. And there was a theory for a while that the growth of Asia was going to supercharge demand for coal. Places like West Virginia would be the big winners and off you'd go. So you saw them buy either they, in some cases, they took companies public, they consolidated a lot of companies, or they would buy into companies uh, themselves. And that bet was wrong in a lot of cases, uh, partly because there was coal elsewhere, the wrong kind of coal in West Virginia. The point was that these companies began to fail quite precipitously. And I mean, really, I think to a degree that people outside don't fully appreciate. In take Boone County, West Virginia, single county, 58% uh, of the jobs vanished in five years. And what's fascinating to me about that is, Richard, you know, I think of this in terms of the, the experience for people caught up in it, which is that it's not just that you lose your job, it's that you then, if you're the male breadwinner in a house, and those tends to be oftentimes very sort of traditional mm -hmm. family structures in some mm -hmm. places, you know, you are suddenly competing for your new job against your, your child or your grandchild. You're, you know, when you're looking for new work. And I think, you know, and we can talk about this, you know, there is this ideal of somebody just picking up and all of a sudden, oh, okay, I'll just become a home health care aide. Well, no, I won't because it injures everything I imagine about myself and my place in the community. I mean, there is this reluctance to do that. And so, um, what to tie it back to Wall Street, what one of the things that people were very aware of was that there were financiers far away, kind of over the political mm -hmm. horizon and the literal horizon, places like Greenwich and Manhattan, where they were making choices that were accelerating the uh, bankruptcies or at least um, making it they were in, they were literally going into bankruptcy court and asking the courts to relieve them of their liabilities for health care and pension commitments. And so for the people on the receiving end of this, the workers, it was like insult to injury. They suddenly felt as if this was just, they couldn't quite believe this was getting that much worse. And I, you know, I, there were these letters. The, the way I got tuned into this was that there was this, in one particular case of a coal company called Patriot Coal, hmm. the, uh, the miners union encouraged workers to write letters to the court explaining why they did not think that the company should be allowed to escape its, its pension and health care liabilities. And the letters should someday go into the Smithsonian because they are in their own way like the sort of precancerous cells of Trumpism. You know, this was now um, long before Trump came to power, but they were describing the feeling that the quote unquote system was abandoning them and that nobody was listening to them and that nobody was giving them what they deserved and that they had lived, as they would describe it, noble lives of labor and that there was nothing for them at the end. And so I remember asking what that I mentioned earlier, the coal miner, David Ifa, and I said to him, uh, you know, essentially, look, weren't you always getting screwed by the by your management? Why is this any different? And he said the difference was that in the olden days, meaning, you know, the 1950s and 60s, when he got into this, he got into it in the 60s. He said, at least we, we had strikes all the time. He was involved in a bunch of them. But one of the differences was we at least knew that the that management, the investment, the investors and the workers were roughly facing the same direction. So if the coal company failed, everybody would get damaged. And what was different now was that they were sort of facing different directions. The incentives had changed in a deep way. So that you could actually, um, you could make a bad bet, mm -hmm. you could bear no financial responsibility ultimately for your own bad bet as an investor, and you could carry on. And meanwhile, the workers would end up on the wrong end of things. And so that, I think, sorry for that very long answer to that question, yeah. but I think you hit on the core of it, which is how you are ultimately um, rendered obsolete by the economy and the and the body language associated with that matters yes. matters yes it's not i completely agree it's not just the what it's the how and that's so in this case the what was different too because the bankruptcy laws allowed them to strip out some of those um liabilities and i agree with some of those just the letters you report are very moving and i think is he the minor that actually 
went to the shareholders meeting. A different guy. That's Larry Knessel who different you're guy. talking about. But uh, they both worked for Patriot Coal. And, uh, and and he just, and and actually you tell us story of him actually driving all the way to the shareholders meeting and a bunch of them being on the back row. And, and it wasn't, I think, it, if I remember it correctly, it's what really stung wasn't that the, the so they sort of made their case about their health insurance and so on, their pensions. It wasn't that they were attacked or that they had these vicious counter arguments against them. It's that they were ignored. That's exactly it. I mean, in a way, he goes there, he screws up all of his of his gumption to go to the shareholders meeting. He waits his turn. He gets up. He's going to tear them apart. And he gets up and he shouts at them. He says everything he possibly can. He says, you know, any profits you have are on the backs of, of, of men like me. And they just didn't even respond. They sat there and, and, and in a way that for him was the greatest insult because they didn't even raise their weapons to clash. And I think he said, you know, none of them even would turn around and, and shout me out that, you know, he wanted to get thrown out by security or something and they wouldn't even do that. And I think there is a metaphor in there for uh, some of these larger matters of, of rage. Yeah. And the sense of, um, you know, feeling as if nobody is listening to you. They didn't. They didn't even pay him the courtesy of disagreeing with him. Precisely. Uh, and yeah. in terms of dignity, I just think. And actually, to talk about this sense of being ignored and, and classism um, in West Virginia more generally, and also, of course, West Virginia, you know, swung very heavily for for Trump. Right. Like, didn't 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 Trump do better in West Virginia than? Anybody for a very long time? Yeah. He took every county. Right? Yeah, he did. He did. And and he grew between 2016 and 2020. Um, Better, yeah. But, you know, the one data point that I think sometimes gets lost that's worth reminding people of, because it, it complicates the West Virginia picture in a kind of thrilling way, I think, which is that Bernie Sanders in 2016 won all 55 counties in West Virginia's Democratic primary. Worth repeating what I just said, Bernie Sanders, you know, the most, in a sense, you know, D Donald Trump's polar opposite, you know, in so many ways, in policy terms, uh, won every county. And the reason why I mention that is that most of all, I think the vote for Trump, you, you, you know, we could sort of attribute it to some of the usual reasons that we know, and they're real, uh, you know, the idea that um, Donald Trump was playing on racist imagery, which appeals to some people in West Virginia. There's just no question about that. And uh, he also you know, put on a coal miner's helmet and went down and said, I'm going to, in his, in his inimitable way, he said, you're going to be working your asses off. I'm going to put you back to work. And he didn't. In fact, he, they lost more coal jobs under Trump than they had before. But what's fascinating is that the vote for Trump and the vote for Bernie Sanders were, were a little bit like going to a shareholders meeting and shouting and saying, you know, I just I want somebody to acknowledge what I'm experiencing and acknowledge this. And... Uh, and that's important because it raises, it changes a little bit what the nature of the of the predicament is. It makes it, I mean, it, yes, it makes it much more complicated, I think, in a way that's useful. And it makes it more about class. Yeah. It doesn't, as you say, it doesn't take race away at all. But I, I think it does mean that as this uh, issue of class, and you talk about classism, mm -hmm. you talk about Joan Williams' work, and you quote um, some other people talking about this, and, and how actually on the left, there's been real kind of move to understand the need for equality of various kinds, but but not mm -hmm. the same attention paid to the white working class. And so that is why you know, Obama's line about clinging yeah. to their guns it become this, a source of great pride. It's why the deplorables thing from Hillary was just sort of weaponized so brilliantly by Bannon and others uh, into this, just this sense of looking down on people. and. I, I think that's right, and I think you're. Do you think that's changed? I mean, the, the fact that Trump did better in 2020, even though, yeah. right? So, right, he won in 2016. More coal jobs got lost. Yeah, did better in 2020, and doesn't that speak a little bit to the failure of the left more broadly? I think it does. I mean, I think there's a few things going on. One is that weirdly, West Virginia's economy benefited for a certain period of time under Trump because of the his natural gas regulations actually yeah. so you had a bit of a sort of boom there was a mini boom there was a boom. mini boom yeah. and then there is a delayed effect before people kind of fully absorb the long-range impact so some of that but i think more broadly yes i think people in west virginia were um 
yeah, there there was this sense that they had chosen Team Trump and they weren't going to give that up. And 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 there was something, there was something. They were, you know, it was they, people were very effectively um, mobilized against things like Black Lives Matter. And but you know what I what I was struck by was the. I mentioned something in the book called West Virginia Can't Wait, which is this slightly interesting kind of oblique political approach. It's a group of people. Yeah, most, talk a bit about that. Yeah, Very interesting. They're, they're sort of young progressives, but they don't use that word. In fact, they, they believe that using the word progressive in West Virginia is political malpractice because it's been poisoned. And so what they'll do is they'll go into little towns and they'll talk about ideas that are in their own way, quite progressive. I mean, actually things that are now very familiar to us from Joe Biden's economic agenda, because, you know, things like a significant expansion of early child care, uh, of, of, of early childhood education, of child care, of all of the sorts of things that are now part of this, you know, I have to use, unfortunately, the sort of political slogan, but the Build Back Better agenda, which is very popular in West Virginia. I mean, I was really... And you see it now today, not just in 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 surveys that have been done on the left, but also Fox News is finding that this stuff is very popular. You just have to divorce it from some of the language of progressive politics, and it does very well. And that's partly what this group is doing. So they're running people for office um, across West Virginia at all levels of the government. And, um, you know, watch this space. I think you may find it's they, they concluded, you know, there's no way to run a third party in any serious way. They are not in a position to, um, to but what they are doing is challenging what they call the good old boys system. And that's essentially what they're tapping into some of what Bernie Sanders did when he won all the counties in West Virginia. And it's very canny. So I would keep an eye on it because it's not specific to West Virginia. It could also be applied in other places, I think. It's interesting. I mean, your image of sort of Trump being the person that sort of jumped up with them at the shareholders meeting, or maybe the kind of one person on the board that heard them, I think is mm. is exact is exactly right. And one of the things I I wonder a little bit about is whether or not the way in which progressives frame some of these arguments don't don't always redound to their political success. Mm. So we'll kind of we will just divert a little bit into some politics because obviously you can write a lot about that mm. too and. I've been thinking a bit recently that maybe one of the big divides in politics is between zero sum politics and win win politics. And so win win politics is a sense of like, if we grow, we can all do better and mm. far, trade will be good overall and so on, as long as we do that. And the trouble with the win win politicians like Clinton and Blair and all that is they didn't really do what they right. said they would on the, on the other side. So it never felt like win win. And no number of numbers were going to convince people otherwise. And then people like Trump, but also I think some of the Brexiteers, even some of the people on the left in terms of trade, and some of the people on the left in terms of some of the issues around race are more zero sum. They're like, well, if they're doing better, yeah. I must be doing worse, right? And so what that means is if Biden pushes an agenda, which is for women or people of color and so on, and there is still this zero sum idea out there, which I think is strong, then that must mean by definition mm. that if I'm a white working class guy, I'm going to do worse. And I don't think that zero sum psychology is going to change anytime soon. And so it means that every time the Democrats mm -hmm. fail to say more about <laughs> this being for everybody, even for men, then that makes them think, oh, well, I must be losing then. I, I've been very struck by that zero sum mentality is becoming sort of the dominant aesthetic of politics. I mean, I and I think that's, um, I mean, it's essentially the sort of politics of existential um, stakes, the idea that it is binary. And, and that, is, that is not, in the end, the path to a functioning political society. And so, yeah, I, I worry about that gravely. I mean, it's one of the things that struck me most about coming back to this country. How do we, and I think the question is, how do we, I, I don't like the phrase win-win. I think it's horrible and it didn't turn out to be right. But I think the basic idea behind it, which is we've got to find a way to make sure that this is, is good for everyone. Um, that's why a, a war on women or a war on men or, a, you know, just it, even that language. Yeah. You know, wars either end in stalemate or you have a winner. And so even that language is kind of very binary. And I think Biden's trying to steer his way through the middle of that. He is, except that he finds himself then almost inevitably having to say, 
except the millionaires and the billionaires. Uh, they are the problem. They're the ones we have. And you know what? Like, I think he's right on a technical basis, on a policy basis. He, everything he's describing, the data on, uh, on the amount of tax that is not collected, that should be and could be put into to the public good, all of that is completely, um, in, completely incontrovertible. What I think is, is risky for him is when he puts it in those kinds of terms. I mean, this is ironic for me to be saying this because I've just written a book that is, you know, equally as splenetic as anything he is saying about the perils of of extraordinary wealth gap in this country. But I just am looking at it, putting on my sort of political hat mm -hmm. for a moment. Um, I think that is riskier for him politically than he is. I, I wouldn't say he doesn't know it, but I think it that has... Um, that is a that it, people are more allergic to that in the United States of America than than they might be in other places, and so he's playing with 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 fire a bit with it. Um, yeah, but he's making yeah he's making us. Yeah. But look, the, you know the irony here too is Richard that a lot of the people around him, you know, these are not folks who are you know coming from the far left. In fact, his core group of advisors are. Pretty much, you know, would probably be described as uh, neoliberal uh, success stories, and yet they are looking at the current state of wealth and tax and these kinds of issues and are saying this is unsustainable. And in some ways, that's the thing for me. That's sort of how I look at this moment, which is that, and I, I quote a few people in the book who are very successful hedge fund billionaires, for instance, who have come out somewhat apart from their cohort and have said, uh, hey, everybody, if we continue on the track we're on, the golden goose is dead. And that's a, that's that's a fascinating turn in American history. Yeah, uh, yeah, I find it when you get you quote Dalio and people like that, and it, it is fascinating when you get the kind of capitalists themselves saying capitalism's in in trouble. I, I agree with that, but I also agree with you that I mean, one of the things I think we've learned is that rhetoric really, really matters. Yes. I mean, even more than before, the way it echoes around, and so just you know, a few tweets from the left about the police, or a few tweets from the right about Dr. Zeus, or what, right? Pick your issue. Yeah. Um, and so how Biden talks about the rich and the ability is, is, is at least as important as whatever, whatever tax rate they get to, I think, right? I, are they the enemy or are they just not paying enough tax? I mean, they're not paying enough tax. We can all agree that, but are they, are they the enemy? Sometimes the language feels like. I think he's using that language partly for tactical political reasons, which is that He's afraid of losing the left flank of his party. And, you know, this is a whole other long conversation about, you know, is he, you know, where would they actually go? Do they have anybody to vote for? If they stay home, is that actually as big a problem uh, as him potentially alienating moderate, uh, winnable Republicans? I mean, there are, there are sort of layers to this, which you will know better even than certainly than I do in terms of thinking about how you build po political coalitions. Um, but I, what I'm what, what I'm what I notice is that he's not saying it by accident and he's made a judgment that that's the right thing for now. And we'll have to, you know, we can come back to this and look at it in a year or two after 2022 and midterms and decide, was he wrong about that? Um, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, you're kind to say I might know more about it, but I've only advised one political party in my life and they lost 90% of their seats at the following <laughs> well, election. In America, though, that would give you an extraordinary platform on which to build your consultancy. So good luck. <laughs> That'll be a big success. My, 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 my phone has not been ringing off the hook <laughs> since since that election. But let's go briefly to Chicago, just in the, some of the time we've got left, and then I'll push you on your on your optimism at the end. But so Chicago, you, first of all, let's say you went to Chicago, right? Was that your next job from Clark? It was, so yeah. tell us about that, that transition and what, and what, what was the, what was the promotion that took you to Chicago? And did you like Chicago as much as West Virginia? Yeah, I was, uh, my, my family's originally from Chicago and I sort of had always assumed I would end up there. And in, in fact, I did. I mean, I got another, what was essentially another internship in Chicago at the Chicago Tribune as a reporter. And it was a kind of, one thing led to another, led to a, a, a job as a baby reporter on the Metro desk and then eventually to being a national correspondent and a foreign correspondent. I, had, I was there at the Chicago Tribune for for close to a decade. And Chicago is also very close to my heart. I mean, it's just a place that if I think I actually, curiously enough, even though I grew up around New York a lot and have 
been working at the New Yorker for a long time, somehow Chicago has always struck me as a more um, understandable city, as an American city. And uh, it's not unique to me. I mean, it, it is the prime destination for anybody who wants to understand the workings of American cities. And this goes all the way back to the early years of the 20th century when it was Frederick Jackson Turner who described it as the, the place where all the forces in the nation intersect. And I think that's that's certainly true. And so there's something about Chicago that's irresistible as an object of study, particularly when it comes to matters of race and power. Because it is a place that is sharply segregated. I mean, one of the things I mentioned is that there are neighborhoods today that are more segregated today than when Martin Luther King marched against segregation in 1966. Um, so it's a, it's in some ways, it's a kind of maddening and persistent target of study when it comes to how we live, where we live, why, and what the impacts are on health and wealth and outcomes. Well, let's talk a bit about that. I, I, I would say just as an aside, an, an example of your writing and storytelling, I love the story of you interviewing a young Barack Obama and then thinking the interview was of such little import that you recorded over the interview a week later. Yes. Well, I'm so glad that you did mention that today. And um, If you need a recording of a totally unsuccessful Chicago politician whose name is lost to the ages, I can get you that because that's how I use the tape. <laughs> I'm sure you, I'm sure you kept all the others after that meticulously, but the one the one with Obama, like pro possibly the first sit down recorded interview that he, he ever did, and and um, you just as what did what did you record over it? Can you remember? Was it? I do. Pop music I recorded or? over it with uh, somebody, a state senator in Illinois named Donnie Trotter, um, who I, I don't Never think would be the president of the United States. But no. I, I went looking for the tape uh, when Obama became a national figure, and I. And I found it deep in the bottom of the box and I sort of held it up with such triumph. And then I went out and I bought a tape recorder that would play these kinds of mini tapes. And there it was, the dulcet tones of Donnie Trotter talking back to me. <laughs> 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 so, no. so it's a great it's a great it's a great detail but you're right you quote robert sampson's great work on on chicago so and you're right hugely segregated and as we mentioned a bit at the top the subprime crisis uh i think you say you quote someone saying the recession never ended in chicago so you see this so again draw that thread like yeah. why how do you connect because as i said the thread of your book is the threads what's the thread from the folks who live in greenwich and, it, and in Wall Street, and what happened on the south side of Chicago in the Great Recession? Well, the person who said that line to me, which was a very astute observation, is not a great sociologist or professor. It's a guy named Maurice Clark, who was a, uh, a homeowner on the south side of Chicago in a neighborhood called Auburn Gresham. And it, the fascinating story about him, about his family, was that in about 2004, two men going door to door salesmen essentially on behalf of countrywide financial corporation arrived at the house and said we can get you a mortgage that will allow you to rent out your house for more money you could fix the broken mortar over here and so on and so on and it was like almost the sort of a perfect example of exactly how they were building their business and remember this is a period of time when countrywide had just instituted sales commissions into its company they were beginning to sell at this huge rate they were advertising around the south side with and this gets again to the sort of what i think of as some of the body language of these issues which are so interesting they were using advertisements of a of a black sprinter a hurdler running down the track and it said, you know, what is standing between you and your dreams? So it's very powerful rhetoric of possibility. And the Clark family took it. You know how this story ends, but it, you know, it's worth just announcing it. They, their, their mortgage more than doubled. They could not afford it. They lost their house and a lot of their neighbors lost their houses too. And, um, and it was this kind of quiet, immiseration because people didn't want to tell each other that they were losing their houses because it was mm. shameful yes you said when he came out and started talking about it everyone came up to him and that was said me too it was like only when he showed up at a church basement for a kind of financial yeah. clinic did he realize oh my god everybody on the block is in this situation so there was something in there what connected it to me which was sort of extraordinary was when i began to realize okay the ideas the ideologists behind the subprime mortgage crisis were 
some of the bank presidents and traders in places like Greenwich, and not just generically places, but actually places like Greenwich. So I, I mention in the book a couple of people like the chairman and CEO of Lehman Brothers, Dick Fold, who had made about $300 million in the seven years leading up to the financial crisis, lived in Greenwich, as did Chuck Prince, chairman and CEO of Citibank, which re you know received the largest bailout in American history, lived in Greenwich. And so I, I just couldn't get beyond, I mean, there's a certain narcissism, I suppose, in the structure of this book that I just found myself struck by how these two places in, in my life that are, that are coexisting within a single political community could be on such completely radically different ends of a transaction and that the effects could be not just specific to the people involved, but to the generations that have, that will follow the generations whose names we don't even know yet. And I was very struck by that, that Maurice Clark's son, Jeremiah, who I saw in his crib and have sort of watched over the last few years as he's gotten older, has no access to that kind of wealth that could have been delivered by a house that would have been passed down through the family. And that is in a in a narrow way a story of um of injustice yeah well if you look i mean the the numbers nationally were that the recession essentially wiped out black wealth there wasn't that much and it it wiped it out and if you look at the maps of the areas that got hit i mean the the more affluent places and the whiter places just they stood still for a while yep. right they just they, uh, which was that you know, of course had people uh, furious that their expensive house wasn't becoming more valuable every year but you know but it didn't really it didn't lose that much ground whereas the predominantly black neighborhoods you're right were absolutely devastated and still haven't recovered no i think net worth is the thing that we don't talk enough about if in washington dc where i live i mean in in when i came back in 2013 the the median white household had a net worth that was 81 times the size of the net worth of a median black household, 81 times. And I think, you know, it was something like on the order of 280,000 versus something like $3,500. I mean, it was just an extraordinary um, separate cosmos of, of financial experience. And I don't think you can have a real conversation about the, about the economy unless you acknowledge that. I completely agree. And I think part of the problem with the politics is that uh, income inequality has risen, but wealth inequality has risen much more. And it has all of these strategic implications and intergenerational ones that you've talked about. But you, I, I think you, you end on a reasonably positive note uh, in the book, I think it'd be kind of fair to say, which is you argue that the pandemic might have helped with this and that these threads connecting us have become more visible. Um, to people, you suggest maybe the fever's broken a little bit on the right. Um, I don't know if I would go quite but, that far no? on that. Okay. What I would say, right. here's what I would say, which is there is a, a degree of um, of the places where I am optimistic is in the the idea that you can't change what you can't see, and that is a point that was made to me actually by somebody who went to prison and came out in this in this in this narrative and I won't tell how he came to that judgment but that idea of uh, essentially the sort of the flamboyance of the problem as a part of getting towards some kind of solution I think is meaningful that things were so grotesque uh, as demonstrated by the pandemic the inequities of the kind we're talking about that it became harder for people who might want to avoid politics to pay no attention and that's different than saying we're cheerfully on the path to recovery, because I, I don't see that at all. I, in fact, I'm, I mean, and you, you and I have had enough conversations for you to know I am sort of grave to the point of probably a little bit unbearable about mm -hmm. some of these things. That I, I worry that that is really, um, that these underlying factors are so much deeper than Donald Trump that the experience of saying, well, we got him out, that was, that was good news, that that is uh, a fantasy and that it's actually the underlying issues. It's, it's the things that made him possible as a politician at all, some of which remain unaddressed. So I would say my optimism, and I, I, I'm willing to be challenged on this, but I, you know, the, my optimism consists in, of the idea that the problems became so profound, such, much as they did at the end of the Gilded Age, when you had things like the I tell a little bit of this that 
I, this is relying on Robert Putnam's work, actually, that he talks about the transition from the Gilded Age to the Progressive Age and how you had people who quite literally watched workers dying in a, in a factory fire and that that had this clarifying effect. And I think one could, are, and they then became, they would marshal their political resources in service of more progressive ambitions. And I think you, one could argue that George Floyd, for instance, the murder of George Floyd, had some of that effect of just beginning to mark a point at which people who didn't want to have to care suddenly had to had to take an issue, had to take an interest in the issue. Right. Interesting. Well, I think you're, I certainly think you're right that you need visibility first. Uh, you have to see the problem to change it to to quote your your response. So um, I think was, I think Quentin Skinner was once he's a British philosopher was once secured on a panel with him and someone said you're being pessimistic. And he said no 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 a pessimist is someone who thinks things are going to go wrong. I'm telling you they've already gone wrong. Um, and, and so that is the sort of sense the rear view has gone wrong, but looking forward, uh, I, I've seen the pandemic as something like an x-ray mm -hmm. bulb yes. going off and exposing totally. these fractures, maybe. And if, if that's right, and some of the racial justice issues that have arisen, then I think at least the preconditions yes. for progress might be put in place. I don't yet see much more than that. I agree with you. I think that sounds right. I think what I see, at least, though, is that we're no longer kind of living in this period in which things that, that the desperation in a place like West Virginia or Auburn Gresham on the south side of Chicago were either explained away because they were regarded as the natural result of economic forces or that they were simply just invisible. I mean, it is worth, which is how it was when I moved back to this country uh, eight years ago, that actually we are living in a period now where these things are well described. I mean, there has been, there has been, um, the present company excluded, there has been really great writing, for instance, about both of those kinds of communities over the last eight years. And there's begun to be, and this I will credit to Richard Reeves, the kind of books like Dream Hoarders that have begun to describe how elites are a part of the problem, that is a literature that wasn't yet in existence eight years ago when I kind of began to open my eyes to this stuff. And that is its own way, a kind of first step towards talking about it as a policy change. Well, uh, you've done your own public service of description in this uh, uh, book, Evan. The book is called, again, Wildland, The Making of America's Fury. It is, as I said at the beginning, richly reported. It's uh, novelistically gripping um, as well as important. It's, it, it, you know, it does, I, there's, there's a thing as a historical novel. I mean, there's a social science novel mm. uh, or a sort of political. Then it has that novelistic feel to it because the characters are so vivid whilst obviously being authoritative as well. So it really was. Thank you. I mean, just as a, as, as a piece of writing, really just triumphantly successful. And I know you well enough for you to know how much it hurts me to say that. So <laughs> you are, well, I'm, that's why I'm going to carry it with me. And Richard, thank you for that. It means a lot to me coming from you. And, and having a chance to talk about it uh, uh, is really uh, is wonderful. So thanks for the invitation. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time. <laughs>